My name is Tony Lane Casserly, TLC. I've been in the blockchain industry since 2011. I co-founded Cointelegraph. It's one of the largest media publications in the entire industry, and I've spent the last five years working on using blockchain technology to provide ubiquitous access to human rights for people across the planet who are oppressed. So my business is called Culture, and it's essentially the idea that the future of government is not government, it's actually culture, and that we will need to redefine the way we think about our personal relationship to territory and to our own individual sovereignty when we experience things like you know, climate change that can reshape our planet, and that fundamentally, um, the systems of the future should be about creativity. Uh, they should be about liberation and self-expression, um, not fear or closed networks um, that are using secrecy to, to propagate the idea of truth, um, that the future we can build with blockchain is really, truly, and purely an inclusive human future that allows us as human beings to live as citizens of this world rather than be separated by a rule of law that could seek to do nothing but divide us from that greater truth and our fundamental human purpose. Um, so thank you all so much for, for having me here today. And I'll, I'll pass the torch. Uh, great. Yeah, um, amen to that. That's, that's, that's a wonderful ambition. Um, I'm Jason Potts. I'm um, director of the Blockchain Innovation Hub, which is a social science research, inst a, a university-based social science research institute. We're um, attempting to, to study essentially the blockchain economy and culture as it evolves. So um, we're essentially a bunch of economists, um, lawyers, um, political scientists, and sociologists really interested in trying to understand this. And one of the key things for us um, is to address this question of, of blockchains and government. Um, what actually comes next in this story? Yeah. Hello, I'm Mark. Um, I run strategy, I'm chief strategy officer for Ecronis, which is a data protection and uh, data storage data management company. We are a software and services company headquartered here in Singapore. Some of the products use uh, bl blockchain, and this is one of the reasons why I'm involved here. Uh, some of the customers are within the government, so uh, we have a pretty uh, good understanding of uh, what they need. But also, in general, I think governments on blockchain is uh, the topic that uh, everyone should be a little bit interested in, because it involves uh, a transformation of uh, the governments, and we're all in the governments. Uh, very likely that we will not be able to avoid uh, this transformation that uh, will uh, uh, utilize blockchain in one another way. And so many governments are trying that. Uh, I will just say that I have also understanding of uh, the government inside because I was in the government role before this one in business. Tony, you said that we can uh, have a completely decentralized government, right? So and, uh, how this government will manage police? So it's a combinatory effort, right? It's not to say that, you know, um, to create a new world, we need to destroy everything that existed. It's like saying, oh, you know what? I'd like a new house, so I'm going to move but burn down the old one so like no one else can use it. It's, we don't necessarily need to dismantle what is working because we shouldn't prevent people from being citizens of nations if that's something that is important to them or something they want to opt into. It's merely the idea that we're going to need to create new networks. Why is it that every system in the world, the way we actually work, the way our identity actually works, the way our relationships to each other work, the business model has changed. We're in a world of open networks. So systems that are based on low trust, closed network, high secrecy, um, like exclusionary systems, that no longer represents even the way any, any of the largest business models in the world and technology work today. And to your question about how do you essentially police against violence? So um, that's an incredible question that I've spent a significant amount of time thinking about because I've had some crazy experiences that have really shown me why it's so important to have some of these institutions. Like when you're dealing um, with nations whose rule of law in terms of the way that they interact with other organizations who have power in, in nations, like violent organizations who deal in underground markets kind of thing. Um, I had experience where I was like, whoa, I realized the importance of policing against that kind of, uh, preventing against that kind of violence. So there are a couple of answers to this, and part of that answer is that 
Um, what we're interested in doing is helping to hospice things that are not working um, and that nations aren't gonna just completely evaporate into thin air. So it's important to understand that. And in addition to that, the other solution that we've thought of from a decentralized perspective, I call it a marketplace of heroes or a life market. It's kind of the opposite of the original kind of dark stuff, which means that if you are in a situation where you are being held across enemy lines or if someone's in a situation where they're being held by a violent organization, that you're actually to able to create a marketplace for heroes. Uh, and renegades. So if someone says, you know, I want to help save this person's life, you can say, well, I'll give you, I'll give this person X amount of whatever to save this person's life. And it's a marketplace for essentially heroes and renegades to, um, in a decentralized way, actually contribute to the greater human good by not only being creating environments where different cultures are self-policing, which is the ideal, but knowing that there are people in the world that are not good people. Um, creating marketplace incentives for individuals to interact with each other. But that's a, that's a really complex problem, and I think that's actually um, something important that I've, I have seen nations provide for people, is that actual real protection in dangerous areas. Yeah, I know that there are private prisons in some countries, and they yeah. can be decentralized in uh, kind of sp slots, and the prison can be bought by a community via price and marketplace, but what about this group of policemen? They should be powerful. Uh, they can, should be able to come or to um, face groups of organized crimes sometimes, which have weapons. This means that these heroes also shall be organized into groups and have weapons, and then if they are pretty powerful, how are we gonna to control them? We need a more powerful group to who can overpower these groups of police, otherwise this will be a kind of uh, decentralized uh, mafia conflicting yeah, yeah. with each other. Uh. I think about justice as a process of restoration instead of as a process of like justice. We think the way the justice system works now is we're like justice is punishment. Like yeah, that guy got what he deserved. Like he treated those people wrong, so now we're gonna treat him wrong. What's up? I win. That sucks. That's not human. I mean, it is like primally, it's like, you know, apes killed each other to survive, but that's not human in terms of the way we've evolved now. Justice should actually be a process of restoration in not saying like, you did something wrong, so I'm gonna hurt you and that's gonna make it right. That doesn't ever make it right. If you've ever been hurt by someone, it doesn't ever make it right, just like hurting someone else back. That never makes it right. What really makes it right is when we come together and we heal. We need to take responsibility for our duty to restore each other. And part of that restoration is going to be empowered by economic liberation. And another element of that is changing the incentive structures in the way that we think about the fundamental underlying nature of justice. We have to have more empathy if the human race is going to truly survive. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. We dream about this. But in reality, the people like to benefit on uh, people who are kind of kind sometimes. If there is no sufficient amount of this kind of people, then um, more evil people, they can just kill them and take their property and uh, um, benefit on this and survive Why kind people die out. In some cases, in ideal world, this should be opposite. It's next next equilibrium, if you like to put that. You have to How change, to get there? Yeah, it's, it's about changing the economic incentive. And, and when you shift, the thing is like when you shift, when you first create financial abundance, right, you change a huge incentive there, right? This is the internet of money. This industry is the internet of money for a reason. So when we shift the economic incentives, when people don't feel like, oh, if I don't kill you, like I'm gonna starve to death, then that shifts a fundamental element of human nature that we've always had to deal with, which is scarcity. We need economic abundance, first and foremost. It's gonna take time. I think it'll take five, maybe 10 years for us to get there, but we're gonna get there. My kids will like never have to think about what it means to have a job, ever. 
they will literally just be able to go online and make money doing anything. Like our, our kids' kids will see the planet Earth before they're maybe like 15 with VR and all of these other technologies. So our world is both getting infinitely smaller, but our human potential and our ability to proceed with our human purpose, our individual purpose, is going to become exponentially more vast and expansive. So fundamentally underneath changing first the incentive for economic abundance, we also have to change the way that people are rewarded in society and, and why we're actually valuing people. And so it's, it's going, and the thing is like, I have models, but I'm, I don't know every single story of every person in this room. I'm sure that you're all amazing people. I'd love to hear stories, but I don't, I don't know. We can't know every person in the world at once simultaneously until it, unless we're all connected with neural nets and we have access to everyone's experience at once, which I don't know if that particular model will actually happen. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just building systems to try and understand how we re-incentivize the way we thought about our own relationship uh, to both our sense of individual and collective humanity. And, and that is a possible future for all of us, but we have to stand up and own it. If we don't own the future, no one is gonna do it for us, and the people who are gonna try to take ownership are the people who are violent. So if we really want this future to happen, we are gonna have to stand up and take ownership of our rights and the future that we want to see in the world, every single one of us. Wonderful, very inspiring. I hope to live in this world. Maybe because of you. <laughs> this world will come faster. All of us, it's not me, it's us. Nothing I do is me, it's all, every single one of you. It's all of us. Yeah, but I'm sitting closer to you, that's why. <laughs> I have a view <laughs> yeah, than everybody. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts, guys? Sorry? Oh, um, so, I mean, how we've been thinking about this as economists, at least, is, is, is actually um, to tr just really ask the question, what actually does government do? Like, well, why do we need governments at all? And what's interesting about this technology, it was essentially invented as a government-killing technology so that we could actually live um, without this. And um, the, the standard economic answer is public goods, right? You need government to provide public goods. Um, the the interesting thing is the price you pay for that. The price you pay around having to protect yourself against various depredations and so on. You need democracy, you need all sorts of voting mechanisms, you need all sorts of monitoring mechanisms, you need um, a sort of fourth estate media to monitor all of this. Um, there's, there's a high cost that is involved in the provision of, of, of public goods. And what we've got now is, you know, for the first time, actually a competing technology in the provision of communities or people to come together, create governance, and to create local public goods. And what, so, I mean, I think the, the, the immediate issue that we've got in front of us here is how we get from here to here. How we go from this system that we've spent somewhere between 5,000 and 400 years creating and, and, and bedding down and becoming very familiar with to a very new system just created a decade ago, um, only a few years ago, really, and what that transition looks like. And one of the key things that we've realized is it actually takes a lot of trust to get to trustlessness. Um, we have to trust a lot in, um, in, in, as Tony was saying, we have to trust a lot in each other, we have to trust a lot in the current systems to actually transition us to this. So an example of this is, is just say in something mundane such as property titling, where um, property titling will be better on the blockchain. That's just uh, for just technical reasons, that's just, let's take that as given. Um, but in places that have succeeded or are appearing to succeed in doing this, such as Sweden and so on, um, actually the places that don't really need it that badly, they've got pretty good property titling systems, whereas places like Haiti and, and, and other places that are just broken in this respect have really suffered in doing this. And the, this is sort of diagnostic of the fact that the reason Sweden was able to pull that off is that we kind of already trust the Swedish government to do that. Um, and I think this is the issue that we've got across a whole lot of regulatory transitions, whether the transition that we're sort of trying to make at the moment actually does require a lot of trust and, you know, I don't want to say faith in that respect, but that's the issue that we're, we're facing right now. Good. Um, that was a very good uh, speech, actually, in the previous one. We mostly talked about the citizens, mm. right? But I would like to uh, take a look at the same issue, governments and blockchain, from the point of view of the policymakers. 
So imagine you're a policy maker. You understand that some kind of transition should be happening. It's, it's actually quite obvious and uh, it's more of a philosophical thing uh, because uh, the nation states will, will change and will virtualize and blockchain looks like an ideal technology to, uh, to be involved. But then you have a choice how to do it. And um, there are two different, completely different ways to start. One way, and probably 20 countries are trying to do it now, is uh, to test blockchain for a limited number of use cases in the government. Uh, I'm sure you all have heard about such examples. Some of them are really popular now, registries on blockchain. A very, very uh, popular idea, quite uh, easy. Uh, you first ha have had paper registries of uh, land, of uh, transport, of uh, property, then you digitalize it and uh, you have uh, kind of a private cloud with uh, uh, this information, but the next step is blockchain and uh, making it available uh, to the smart contracts that can access it uh, directly, so that looks like a very good uh, use case. And there are many more obvious use cases, like escrow. It's obvious that escrow can be done on blockchain, right? Uh, and there are use cases specific for uh, different countries. So a lot of countries have tried that. US, Canada, several countries in Europe, Denmark, Sweden, Estonia have tried many things. There is the second approach. The second approach is, um, um, I would call it more like Adam Smith approach. So you create the uh, legislation that allows blockchain uh, processes to thrive in the country. And several countries have done that as well, and some of them are doing it now. Um, for instance, uh, Dubai. Has anyone heard about uh, what Dubai is doing with blockchain? Um, they, they have created a plan and they are implementing it, and this plan is not about specific use cases. This plan is about moving more or less all economy to the blockchain. Um, some countries are um, very risk-taking and uh, going even further. Uh, for instance, uh, we expect that Malta will announce a new soon because they are thinking about a regulator that might uh, be the um, you know, ded dedicated entity in the country to make sure that uh, companies working with the blockchain will be uh, operating at a maximum capacity in the country and introduce legal framework. So, long story short, uh, already now, 20, maybe 25 countries are trying something, and in five years from now, we'll have a, a library of the best practices of that. So this will be the time when we will be able not just to talk about governments on blockchain, but we'll likely see the governments of block on blockchain, and then all the other governments will see the good examples. So I expect there will be exponential growth in uh, implementation of blockchain-based process for government services. We don't know which exactly now, uh, but uh, in three to five years, the situation uh, will dramatically change. So what are the state services when it can be um, uh, put on blockchain within a few years? Is it um, cryptocurrencies, is it fluid use case, instead of central banks who sometimes print money for their friends, like it happened in Russia and many other countries, I mean, 19s. <laughs> and, uh, I, is, could it be kind of uh, property register on blockchain like in Georgia right now? And perhaps voting on blockchain, budgeting, state spending, cards, and so on. What are the most... I will, I will give the brief answer. Business. So to understand which services uh, will be uh, the first ones to use blockchain, I think uh, the right way is just to think about a smart contract because uh, it will uh, work together with a smart contract anyway. So. Uh, today, if you make any transaction uh, that involves the government, for instance, you buy a house, A buys a house from B. So today you need to involve the lawyers, you need to involve, uh, uh, there will be an escrow in the bank, there will be bankers themselves, so a lot of people are involved and it's uh, not very efficient. But uh, uh, another way to do it is that uh, the seller uh, creates a, a smart contract and a buyer transfers uh, funds to the smart contract, and then there are government services, all that are needed, that have a direct access for the smart contract. For instance, there is a registry of property, right? And uh, the smart contract releases the money to the seller only if there is the new line in the state registry of property saying that now A owns the house. 
a very simple idea. But this implementation means that uh, everything related to uh, transaction uh, buying and selling and property and uh, all the registries can be on blockchain. Uh, banking procedures uh, uh, also can be, of course, on blockchain. Uh, today, quite a lot of governments are working on uh, uh, insurance, uh, healthcare, things like that that can also involve blockchain. Can I come in on this? I mean, my view on this is that use cases is the wrong way to think about this. Yeah. That what governments do is governments regulate, they legislate, they write laws, they, they, they impose themselves into the economy. And when we think about what, what governments will do, is the problem is, is that there's different regulators, there's different parts of government, and they're all imposing themselves on the economy and society in different places. The real issue isn't to map government use cases, but to make sure that these things don't um, conflict with each other or at least um, try, try to minimize that. And I think the major sort of 2018 issue going forward is really around whole of government joined upness. Um, a classic example is what, is what we just saw in Korea, where you had the Justice Department going in one direction, you had Treasury going in the other direction. It was basically a, 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 um, a real-time civil war that, that blew up um, all the crypto exchanges, and they gone, bang. Um, that's the problem that we want to avoid. What we want to try and have is joined up intra-government um, regulation. Now multiply that by every single country. Now we've got intergovernmental, um, which is the best, place, the best practice um, case. But I think this sort of coordination problem is the government issue we've got right now. I'd like to posit that it was originally said government was originally supposed to buy public services. I thought government's original function was jurisdiction and that if it is government's job to provide public goods, I am so afraid. Um, more than 50% of the world <laughs> lives under a dictatorship. More than 50% of the citizens on our entire earth live under dictatorship regimes where they are not even allowed to have access to their own rights as human beings. Um, so in my mind, it's about how do we cooperate effectively to build a better system? How do we change the incentives so no one has to be afraid? And it's not about saying, we, we don't, you don't replace through destruction. If you want real liberation, you evolve through creation. So the first government services I think we're gonna see on blockchain, something that we're working on is essentially our open source standard called Web of Trust. And this is something that I'm working on with a group of people. It's an open source collaborative community, but uh, a, technolo a technology collaborator who's the co-author of the TLS standard, which is essentially the encryption layer for the entire web. And what we're working on with Web of Trust is essentially creating an open source standard for identity and registration that can almost serve as a research and development wing for nations, but that's owned by people, right? So let's say that I am a refugee, and we're going to see the number of refugees. I mean, in the last three years, over a million people have appeared literally just outside of Bangladesh in a refugee camp. It is, it is absolutely remarkable. And we're gonna see maybe you know, 15 million more people move there within the next five. You know, we, don't, we don't know what is going to happen with climate devastation. No one does. But the entire continent of Nigeria could end up underwater. Nations are not going to be able to take in all of those people. They're not. We're already not able to deal with the fact that we're experiencing as a human race a second holocaust in terms of what's happening with the Syrian regime. And if we don't have empathy there, I seriously doubt that people are gonna have empathy when the violence is not man-made, but made by the destruction we are all accountable for of our planet Earth. So web of trust is essentially an open source standard. So if I'm a refugee, I can say, well, listen, I left my house during an airstrike or like my entire town is underwater right now or my entire country is underwater. Um, but I came here with my mom so my mom knows who I am, so my mom can verify me. And I met this guy, and I built him a house, right? So he can verify that he's known me for like, you know, six months, and that I was able to build him a, you know, I have skills as a carpenter, I could potentially work in construction, and then there's this group of kids that I met in the camp, and they all have like cell phones, and uh, I taught them English. So 
they can verify that they've known me for three months and that I have English language speaking skills. I also have the ability to be a teacher. So you, you really gaining a portrait through essentially a network effect of who we are as human beings, how we interact with the world and how we're perceived. And it's really looking at the network effect, like what is the impact that you have on the lives around you? Because that's really a huge piece of what shapes who you are. How do you impact every person in this room, right? And so it's really about shifting that model and in doing that, that gives nations the ability to say, well, these people would otherwise not have an identity. And if they had an identity, it would be an identity of ownership. You know, like I hear people talk about refugees like as economic assets. I'm like, excuse me? This is a person. This is not an asset. This is not a stock. You're not like, this is not, you're not, you're, if you're investing in someone's life, it shouldn't be because, you know, you're, you're classifying them as something that you own. This is a new, we're not creating a new generation of slaves here. Refugees have to own their own rights. All of these people have to own their own rights. And so in doing that, it allows nations to make more effective decisions. If you want to apply to a host nation, if that's something you're interested in doing, I don't have any right to prevent you from doing that. And then nations can understand, okay, well, here's who this person is. And now I have some context. And so it's really about finding a way to create open source standards for collaboration throughout these different systems that can allow us to actually create change without violence, which is really the way that the future needs to unfold healthily. OK. Thanks so much. So I see a lot of hands. <laughs> they are waiting for you. <laughs> 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 but then if we kind of have decentralized government, we don't have a um, president and the first lady yeah, so or, or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the models of leadership will change. And in my mind, the way that I think about cultures is that we'll have hundreds of different, different leadership models work differently for totally different people, right? Like I'm a woman, okay? I was born a woman, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, and you know, I go to things like Burning Man. And Burning Man is like this, it's like creative liberation, like people are walking around like running, and not me, not me personally, but like people are running around naked, like it's like this crazy experience in the middle of the desert where people have, uh, it's, 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 it's a giant party. And uh, it's, it's a, one of the most interesting models for like a temporary autonomous zone, which is now seen as a permanent autonomous zone um, that we may have ever seen or that we may have ever had. So am I any less of a woman because I express my self-identity by liberating my, liberating the way I express my relationship to my own body. Like you could also use not me personally, right? <laughs> but like the free the nipple movement, right? Are these women who are a part of this movement less women because they feel comfortable, they don't wanna wear a bra and they feel like if guys shouldn't have to wear a shirt at the beach, neither should I, no. But does that also mean that a woman who chooses modesty in saying, well, I opt into the Muslim faith in a very conservative way, in the same way that you have like Hasidic Judaism, and I feel most comfortable when my body is fully covered, I'm wearing a full body veil, because that is my way of expressing my own relationship to my womanhood. Now, our, is myself, who's kind of like somewhere in the middle, um, or you know, this full on liberation, or this full on expression of modesty, are, are any of those models of being a woman, do any of those models that I choose make me less of a woman? No, not at all, not at all. And so I think when we look at new models of governance, we're gonna see people from different backgrounds with different ways of organizing, different environments and societies that they feel comfortable in, different ambitions in life. Different groups of people will organize and self-organize differently. And in my mind, what I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to gather as much information as possible about what models are effective for what people who enjoy living their life in what way and how can we create interdependency between people from totally different backgrounds with totally different perspectives in a way that liberates us all to be the women, the men that we, the, you know, the, you know, the, the trans identities, the any kind of person, just to be the people, to be the people that we want to be. And, and how can we all embrace that in ourselves while being interdependent 
on each other collectively. So for me, this is just a giant research project to figure out what, what, is, what is our means to get to the ends of creating an environment that imbues every person on the planet with the potential to pursue their ultimate perspective of human happiness. Thank you. So perhaps three questions. Oh, how mm -hmm. can I choose to mine? Okay, let's start from you, then you, and you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm I'm from Indonesia. This year, Indonesia gonna have 150 cities and province gonna do election, and next year gonna be legislative and presidential election. What is your thought or your advice for a country like us to apply blockchain for the election? What will be, I know benefit, but what will be the downfall and the pitfall and what, how to overcome? Thank you. Um, so, so the blockchain for elections, I mean, uh, this is one of these issues where for some countries this is an issue, for other countries it's not at all. And my view on this is that it actually just seems to be that this is one of these situations where the main benefit here is trust in the process. That, that putting a, uh, an election on a blockchain is basically providing radical transparency about that process, which therefore creates unimpeachability of an outcome. Um, now, uh, I mean, that's not just for government elections, sort of uh, the same thing for corporate voting. Um, there's a lot of other situations where we see that, that application there. So um, this may not be faster or more efficient or, more cost or, or less costly, but this is really a, an example of the technology actually working as, I mean, the promise of the technology to actually provide trust. Um, well, you can't rig them anymore, is the obvious thing. Um, the, 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 the benefits from being able to rig elections or to lie about them are going to, to be obviously um, less. Now, there's your problem, right? Because a lot of people benefit from being able to rig elections or to steer at things. So again, this is the trust. Trustlessness takes a lot of trust to get there. And the, the places where we kind of know that elections are, are broken um, are exactly the places where it's going to be really hard to get blockchain elections into those spaces. And the places where we kind of know the elections work pretty well are probably the places we're going to get them first. So uh, I think, you know, again, this is something we all need to push on um, to try and get us to that, yeah, uh, that well, equilibrium. Uh, I will add a few words. So you asked what are the pitfalls, what are the drawbacks. So as an idea, the idea is great. So there are no pitfalls in the idea. But elections, uh, that's such an important process that you need to be double sure that everything works. We're just a little bit not there with, uh, you know, still time we need to test and move forward with the scalability, with the security. Security should be 100% with the performance of the blockchain solution. So elections are likely not something you want to try this year on blockchain for such a big country. But over time, if, the, if these issues are resolved and improved, that's a perfect idea. I, I think about this in a sort of different way than I think most people do. I, I think there's obvious, I mean, I could give the obvious answer in terms of voting in blockchain. I'm sure in certain societies and cultures and all of these things that will exist. But I think that voting in and of itself is almost like a form of friction because what you're saying when you vote is I'm taking my power to act for myself and solve my own problems and or think freely and really fully engage in my society and I'm giving that power away to this person in a lot of different instances. Like voting works really well for some people of that mindset or some models, but I, what I'd really like to see personally in terms of the way we think about the evolution of our collective human future is a translation of voting into direct action and direct activism, like civic responsibility. So rather than like you seeing a problem being like, oh man, there are potholes, like, you know what I should do? I should like go vote for that guy so he can maybe try and get some other people to convince them to fix the potholes maybe? I'm not sure. But instead of doing that, like why don't you just be like, you know what, how much does it cost to like make some concrete? And you're like, there are holes in the road. I think about this all the time just when I'm like walking down the street. What I'd like to see is a world where everyone in the city is like, oh, there are like potholes in the street. Like I'm gonna get a group of like 30 people together, like maybe a group of my friends or something, and we're gonna go fill the potholes. And we're just gonna do it for everyone. And we're gonna record publicly that like we went out there and we filled the potholes and we picked up the trash 
So everyone in our city, our local town, our community, our state can see that me and my group of friends spent two weeks traveling around the state filling every single pothole in New York. Right? And I think when we change that model, that's when we're really going to see our world go from this process of like friction into something where everyone, we need to be engaged in making life better for everyone around us. And that's the transition I'd really like to see. I can imagine that sometime in the nearest future, we will elect presidents in messengers. You don't need to go to election uh, stem, uh, places where different parties control election process to prevent fraud. Now you can prevent it with blockchain and, and make election voting very easy. This reduce cost of coming to election, joining elections, and far more people will be participating. And uh, this will provide more incentives for politicians and for less developed countries that can solve a problem when a politician uh, get control of elections so he can tweak results or do not get access to opposition for elections now the opposition will be able to run their own election on blockchain which will be legitimate that's very powerful thank you i promise it one more uh, question please this is the last one okay uh, uh, Matt Booker, okay, I have a you question and you. regarding okay. the, um, what you just, uh, ah, yo, yo. sorry, sorry? Just so, yes. okay, so, yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. So I think we all agree that uh, blockchain will uh, streamline government processes, yeah, but the transition, the progress is essentially uh, incremental. The real change of blockchain is the creation of a peer-to-peer -peer society, and I think what we will see is a, actually a challenge, a bottom-up challenge of a status quo. So governments, they are essentially adherent to their own power structure, and we will see an emergency or an emergence of a, a, a bottom-up governance, and these two models will clash. So my question to you is how you see this clash, this conflict unfold. So, I mean, I, I would completely agree with that, assess w yep. with that assessment of the situation we're in. Um, we've got, what is it, 193 countries in the world today. Um, we've got about, I'm going to guess, 100 million corporations. Um, if we go back 300 years, we had, there was a time probably around the 1600s when we had 193 corporations. Um, I think this is where we're going, is, is that the, 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 the nation, I mean, it's not necessarily going to be a civil war between governance and government, but rather the gradual erosion of government and nation states because of this just, as we find new ways of you know, forming partnerships and groups and communities and providing blockchain governance over that, now we've got a local government that can do things. And we'll just keep adding those and layering them and we'll, we'll be citizens of many of these things. And that, that evolutionary process where we go from a small number of nations to a world of you know, potentially millions of governments. I don't know what we, what we call these things yet, but um, yeah, but that's where we're going. Um, and that's an evolutionary story rather than a revolutionary story. And I kind of hope that's how this plays out. I'm working so hard to try and eliminate the need for people to go into this feeling like they should hate each other. Because we're never gonna create change if you approach a system and you're like, we need to appreciate things for what we've done. Like I almost describe this as like someone who's like, I hate you mom and dad. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm like, okay, like listen, your parents like have done, like you know what I mean? Like your parents have always been a part of your life. Like they helped do this and that for you. I'm kind of like, it's, it's that kind of a, it's like that kind of a relationship of like, and, and I actually define it in that way because what a lot of people are doing when they're declaring sovereignty is actually very similar to a model of people saying like, I am going to emancipate myself from my family. And in some instances, like, you need to do that, right? Like, in some instances, you have a parent who's, like, physically abusive or something, and you need to get out. Like, you need to go. Like, emancipate yourself, you know? And in other situations, it's like, is this just, like, some bottled-up angst about control related to the actual dynamic that people have with their parents? So, like, I'm working so hard in my own world and everything I'm doing to just try and cultivate some mutual respect and to try and create greater economic opportunity for everyone and solve greater problems together. 
rather than saying, let's use models of like, let's counteract violence with violence. Like, let's, let's just try and restore a situation and like, cult let's cultivate. Let's cultivate a relationship and let's cultivate mutual respect for each other in this change. Because at the end of the day, whatever hat you put on, whatever time of the day, like we come into this world and we leave this world the same, like we're a human. So I would, I would really, what I, I've spent a lot of time and I would really hope that we can, you know, progress in these changes without causing any kind, without, without unnecessary conflict. We don't need to fight. You know what I mean? We don't need to fight. Like we can all embrace each other and just work harder to understand where everyone is at and, and what people's needs are, what the needs are of your community and what the needs are of um, yourself. Um, you asked about the clash, just uh, one comment. Um, it's important to understand that the society is changing uh, as well and maybe the clash is not that big because blockchain uh, implementation in uh, such fundamental process is not a fast thing. And say, when I talk to 15 year olds today, uh, you cannot uh, uh, avoid noticing that they live much more in a digital world than we and in a much more digital world. So the connection to the nation states is not as large as uh, in the previous generations. So the life, uh, is likely getting more or less a combination of smaller communities of your project, your friends, you can be in dozens of such sub-communities and they're all distributed and they are partially somewhere in the cloud and you don't care much where these people are. You also travel. So the relationship between the person and the state changes as well. That's important. Yeah. Perhaps the last short question, please. statement and then a question. Um, so I lead a billion dollar portfolio and I work for IBM and I sold a company before that. And I say that because I feel like we're sitting here talking about, uh, like, I, I, like I don't subscribe to the laissez-faire belief that government is a regulator. Um, so I work with every single, most governments every single day and what they come to me and they say, hey, we don't know what policies to pass uh, that would ultimately en uh, enable us to create a better future. And that is a huge issue in so much that the World Economic Forum has said, hey, we want to create uh, the uh, fourth industrial uh, center, and then they you know, want to help develop policies. And I also think that the function of government is to buy, like if you, you also miss out on the function of government as a buyer of goods for citizens. And so if you, if you, when I think about it, governments have an issue where they're trying to reinvent themselves so Switzerland is trying to become, and, I, and I'm, I talk to the most senior government officials in these geos, and Switzerland is trying to become the new cybersecurity hub of the world because they're not generating money on offshore banking. Uh, Oman is not generating the same money on oil and gas, so they're like, hey, we actually want to uh, reinvent ourselves. And every government is trying to figure out how to do that, and blockchain just happens to be a mechanism for actually doing so, right? Mm. Um, and so the issues that I've seen is, and when I worked at the White House for not, not, not this administration, but President Obama, the biggest one that we worked on was interoperability. And for me, blockchain was focused on interoperability as it pertains to modularity. That was so key <coughs> that we didn't really touch on today. Um, and what my, my point being, and my, I guess my question is, the issues that these governments face, like one, the North Carolina said to me, uh, we, we want to host government, like we need, agencies are coming to us to build blockchains, but we don't know what to do. Um, you know, I had a, Denmark came to me and said, hey, we can't, we have a problem with MSRAs, and we can't track uh, how many antibodies that that uh, cow has, uh, has taken, and we have inspectors who go to refrigerators and uh, track um, numbers, instead of having an IoT device track that in real time. And then they want to be able to share that information across different B2B, and government to government. So my, my question to you, I, so I don't subscribe to like the use case, I've, I've probably built about six blockchain uh, solutions for governments, either POCs, MVPs, and so forth. Um, so my, I guess my question to you is if you're thinking about giving government advice on moving forward, uh, what would it be and why? The main thing that needs to happen right now is, I mean, governments are reaching out in, in, in a sense and trying to figure out what to do. Um, we need to talk to them. We need to try and educate. We need to um, just essentially 
try and arrive at solutions that uh, the community is happy with, right? Because this is basically the process that would otherwise take place as a legislative action and that would all take place in Parliament and, and so on and, and, and out it would come. We've got an opportunity to actually do this now, in real time now. Um, and I think the crucial thing is to actually try and take this opportunity to educate, to speak to, to use the sandbox opportunities, but um, to, you know, to actually try and um, jointly create these these rules. Um, otherwise, we're just going to end up with um, rules being imposed that are more or less modifications of the existing ones, which are not designed for this world, that this world is trying to build. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really quick, just to add layer onto that, we need to build for humans, not systems. And I think that people need to remember why they got involved in these things in the first place. 